Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this incredible tree, the American chestnut. And we're going to start our story at the end of the Pleistocene, about 12,000 years ago, when the glaciers began to retreat. And at first, um, conifers like uh, spruce and hemlock and pines began to dominate. But pretty soon, some of the hardwoods also began to appear, oaks and some of the other uh, species that are familiar with today. The chestnut is actually a fairly late comer uh, to the eastern forest. But here is the um, former distribution of the American chestnut. So uh, paleobotanists tell us that about 2,500 years ago, uh, chestnut began to appearance. And we know that from uh, pollen deposits in various areas, bogs, and so on and so forth. And so the uh, chestnut quickly overtook uh, many of the forested areas and became, in fact, a dominant tree in many parts of the Appalachian mountain chain. So basically, from Maine all the way down to um, North Georgia and Alabama, but especially among um, the mountains of the Appalachian uh, states, uh, chestnut became very, very prominent. There are reports that in some areas, you know, one out of four trees in the forests were chestnut. Um, the chestnut uh, especially liked elevations between two to 4,000 feet, uh, slopey, well-drained soils, and somewhat acidic, so around pH 5, pH 5 and a half uh, soils. It does not like heavy clay soils, but on slopey areas, it managed to um, get enough uh, drainage that it could hang on. So the chestnut quickly became a dominant tree for several reasons. When it's a seedling, it is shade tolerant, unlike some of the other hardwoods and especially conifers. Uh, there are reports of chestnut seedlings staying alive for 20, 30, 40 years in an understory situation until the, the big trees fall over and there's light and then the chestnut takes off. It can grow as much as a foot a year and can get to be a very, very large and dominant tree in the forest. In fact, uh, it, its height is only rivaled by that of the yellow poplar or tulip tree, if you will, especially in the Appalachian, Southern Appalachian areas. So you can see the distribution here in New York. Um, it, it, it was found in the southern tier, uh, up in the Tuck Hill Plateau, along the uh, Hudson River Valley, and down into New York City, Long Island area. But um, it was especially important in the southern states. It could grow very large, as, as you see in this old photograph, with this family standing in front of the tree. The tree can grow could get to be about 100 feet, 120 feet tall, and may have reached the circumference of seven to eight feet wide. So you can see this person standing here. Uh, picture is a little fuzzy because I had to enlarge it somewhat in order to fill the screen, but you can see how large these trees are and, and the trunks of them. And so once it's released from shade, it can grow very, very rapidly. And um, um, it also can grow from sprouts. So if one of the trees is cut down or falls over or dies for some reason, then it can sprout very easily and, um, and, and uh, establish itself again into its former uh, majesty. It is a reliable nut producer 
unlike some of the oaks which produce nuts every two to three year cycles, the American chestnut was able to produce nuts every single year. Now this is a photograph taken, I believe uh, in the 19 teens, and there were reports that on a, in a one West Virginia railroad station, about 155,000 pounds of chestnut were shipped in one year. So it was, it was a tremendously important tree uh, for wildlife and for humans as well. Um, blue jays, turkeys, raccoons, bear, the passenger pigeon, and numerous other animals uh, lived off of the chestnut. And the mountain people in um, the Appalachia would turn the pigs out in the fall when the nuts were ready and leave the pigs out there for a um, couple, three months sometimes mm -hmm. until all the, all the nuts were eaten by the um, livestock. And it is one of the most nutritious nuts in terms of its protein content so that uh, pigs were fattened up on, on these nuts and uh, were then uh, taken to market. So it, it was a very, very important um, tree for a number of different reasons. This again is an old photograph and, and the first series of photographs are gonna be pretty old, black and whites, because as you'll see in a few minutes, the chestnut is no longer with us as it once was. But we'll talk a bit more about that in a few minutes. So the trees grew very large and they were very important timber um, trees. In addition to um, the wood that they produced, they also uh, were used for tannin, which of course was used for the production of leather by, by curing the hides with the tannin. And uh, it is a very good um, lumber tree. It is extremely rot resistant it is as rot resistant as a locust and, and in some cases even more so. The wood is easy to work. It doesn't check or warp. It has a nice grain, medium uh, color grain and it's, and it's easy to uh, mill into a variety of different products. Um, so the, the value of standing chestnut in these forests was estimated to be tens of millions of dollars. It was a very, very important tree for uh, the people, and especially in the Appalachian Mountains, where they um, harvested and sold, sold the lumber. I took this picture a number of years ago at a demonstration farm in Maryland. And everything that you see here in the foreground, as well as this barn, is made of chestnut. So as I mentioned a moment ago, it was very rot resistant, so it was often used for fence posts and for fencing material. Uh, the uh, lumber was used for barns. Uh, shingles for both barns and houses were made of chestnut and many other uses including railroad ties, uh, coffins, uh, furniture, barn sidings, telephone poles and all kinds of uses for this very very easy to work and rot resistant um, lumber. So um, it was um, a very important tree for a variety of reasons. The uh, chestnut um, can start producing nuts as young as five to seven years old. Um, so uh, both male and female flowers are found on the same tree, but you need at least two trees to cross pollinate. It, it does not self pollinate. So these are the male catkins that you see over here. 
I took this picture uh, in uh, Western Maryland, in the mountains of Maryland. And uh, in the springtime in May, June, it's relatively late to, to flower as far as trees are concerned. In May or June, it produces these catkins and then it's just, it looks like it's snowed. These, these catkins are so beautiful and fragrant as well. Uh, the chestnut is a member of the beech family. So beech, oaks, uh, chestnut, and chinkapin all belong to the same family, the Fagaceae, and um, uh, produce a, a variety of different uh, flowers, as you see over here, as well as delicious nuts. Here are some burns, burrs. Um, I took this picture actually right here in Alfred. I, set up a demonstration uh, grove a few years ago. Uh, unfortunately, not many of the trees are still alive, but I have about a dozen trees. And so the burrs mature uh, around September, October, and then either animals come and pick them off like bear, or uh, when the burrs are mature, they fall to the ground. Now. To pick them up is very difficult because these spines are extremely sharp and will prick your fingers. But if you wait long enough, or if you use heavy gloves, you can open them up. And um, otherwise, they'll, they'll open on their own. Uh, I always have to uh, battle the deer and some other animals because uh, if I don't get to the burst fast enough, they'll come and, and, and pick the nuts out and, and I won't have any left uh, for a variety of purposes. But these are um, typical, about the size of, um, oh, maybe a, a large ping pong ball, slightly larger perhaps. And uh, typically there's a cluster of them uh, found at the, um, end of a, a, a branch. So these are the remnants of the male catkins. The female flowers are here at the base. And of course, those are the ones that are going to be the seed producing parts of the, uh, of the plant. Well, the American chestnut was very important for a variety of reasons that I mentioned until the arrival of the blight. Now, the blight is uh, caused by a fungus, and we'll talk more about the fungus in a moment. But the first uh, indication that there was something wrong with the American chestnut was in 1904 in New York City, more specifically in the Bronx Zoo, large American chestnuts began to die. They didn't know at first why, they thought it was drought or some kind of toxin or poisoning or something. And they brought in a plant pathologist who um, discovered the fungus growing on the tree. Large trees could be killed in as little as a few weeks time. And so at first they didn't know what this fungus was, where it came from. Um, they took it in the laboratory, they identified it as a type of fungus that uh, produces uh, certain types of spores. They didn't know where it came from, but uh, they noticed that Asian chestnuts, that is Chinese or Japanese chestnuts were not nearly as uh, heavily uh, infected and they didn't die. So they began to suspect that perhaps this fungus was brought from somewhere in Asia. Uh, they tried to save the Bronx trees, but uh, within a few months, within few months to a year, most of them are dying. By 1910, the infection foci spread from the New York City area into Connecticut, New Jersey, and began to be in Pennsylvania. By 1920, the infection front was well established 
as you can see through half Pennsylvania, the lower Hudson Valley and Catskill into New Hampshire and Vermont and, and kept spreading. Interesting that many of the diseases that encounter, including not just diseases, but insects tend to start out uh, from the east and spread westward. And I say interesting because the prevailing winds, of course, have come from west to east. So you would think that uh, that would somehow retard the movement of the spores or the uh, infectious propagules. But in fact, uh, we often see an east to west spread of uh, various types of disease causing organisms that we encounter and some of the insects as well. By the 1930s, it has spread through a large portion of the natural range and wherever it spread, it killed um, the trees within a fairly short period of time. The uh, trees did not have any resistance or if they did, if there had been some trees that might have had some resistance, no one ever knew because people panicked and started cutting the chestnut in advance of the disease front. And it's, it's something like this is happening these days with the um, ash borer. And I've had several people coming to my house and say, let me cut your ash trees down before the ash borer gets to them. And I say, no, because if there are any resistant trees, we'll never know it. If you cut the trees down, then um, we'll never find those resistance when, if they exist at all. Well, to make a short story long, by the 1940s and 1950s, uh, the uh, disease front had spread to uh, more than 80% of the American chestnut. It is estimated that over 3.5 billion, and, and you can see I put billion in capital letters, three and a half billion trees died in a relatively short period of time of 50 years. They've tried all kinds of techniques to stop it. They cut trees down in advance of the disease front. They tried various types of fungicides. They tried uh, cutting the trees and burning them and uh, things seemed to work. Uh, in the 19-teens, the state of Pennsylvania, or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, spent millions of dollars, and this was like in 19-teens, so millions of dollars were a lot of money back then, even more so than today, uh, to try to stop the disease front, but nothing seemed to work. So here's a picture of some of the dead trees. Long after the barks lost off, the trees are still standing because as I mentioned a moment ago, they are very rot resistant. So these, these dead skeletal remains can stand there for 20, 30, 40 years and, and still um, be in the forest unless of course uh, other trees come in and take over the um, ability to move and, and grow in the light that is now available to them. But you can see that, that this, this looks like um, an atom bomb went through here or fire went through here. And that's all chestnut that had died as a result of the blight. This is a young seedling that I took a picture of. And in the summertime, you can see from a far away distance, which trees are infected. This is uh, sometimes referred to as flagging. Uh, the canker that I'll show you in a second is somewhere in the trunk over here. Uh, the trunk, uh, the, the canker will girdle the trunk. Everything distal that is above the canker will die because the trees uh, ability to move water to the xylem, the outer ring of tissue under the bark. 
uh, is disrupted. And so the tree is not getting water now. And then the branches turn brown. Of course, you can't see that in the wintertime, but in the summer, you can see it and uh, see trees that are dying. Even if you're driving on the highway at 50 miles an hour and you look over, you can see dying trees. Notice that this uh, tree is not very big. Today, the American chestnut is basically relegated to an understory existence. Uh, it will sprout from rootstock, and we'll talk more about that in a second, get to a certain size. It will be infected by the fungus uh, and then it will die back. Then it'll sprout again live to a certain number of years, sometimes get bigger than this. And then uh, it's infected and it ties back and this cycle continues. Now, suppose that all the chestnut in a given area die. Doesn't the fungus die if it doesn't have anything to live off of? And the answer to that, unfortunately, is no, it does not die because it can live on oaks. Oaks is then we refer to as a reservoir species. It does not kill or hurt oaks, except a couple of different species of oaks down south, but it can exist on oaks for a long period of time and basically do nothing, just wait until the chestnut comes back again, if it ever does. I took this picture in Massachusetts a number of years ago. Uh, the discoloration that you see over here is simply, I wetted the, um, the trunk a little bit so that you could see the canker a little bit better. I will see another picture of a canker in a moment, but it starts out in a wound. And unfortunately, wounds are all too common in chestnut, whether it's from insects, or in this case, this branch union that you see over here. This, for a period of time, represents an open wound uh, on the tree. And then the fungal spores get in here and start the formation of a sunken lesion that we refer to as a canker. These lesions then get bigger and eventually girdle the entire stem. And once the stem is completely girdled, then of course everything distal to that will die because I mentioned a moment ago that the flow of water is disrupted. Here's a uh, stem that has been girdled. I did not take this photograph. One of my former colleagues did, but you can see that the fungus has completely girdled now. It has this orangish color. By the way, these little white things that you see over here are lenticels or little openings in the trunk through which gas exchange occurs between the air and the bark. So this is not part of the can canker. The fungal growth that you can see is over here. The fungus is probably a little bit farther advanced on both sides, uh, but it's not quite visible just yet. The fungus that uh, produces the canker has this kind of orangish yellow coloration, which is pretty characteristic of this particular fungus. This is a close-up view of um, canker that is actually sporulating. The fungus produces two different kinds of spores. There are so-called summer spores, which are produced by sexual reproduction. That is, you need the equivalent, we don't call them male and female in fungi, but, the, but that's basically the equivalent plus and minus. Uh, strains have to come together to form sexual reproduction. And these low black things are the necks of the um, low uh, globular uh, so-called parathesia or spore forming pockets. And when uh, the environmental conditions are right, 
then the spores will be ejected to these long black necks through openings. So these are the sexual spores, and these are the so-called long distance uh, dissemination. The spores can fly hundreds of miles uh, when air currents or wind pick them up. There are also asexual spores that one does not need a sexual partner. And uh, those are basically local spread. So within the trunk, from one area to another, or for short distances between two adjacent trees, if they're close enough, those are the asexual spores. So this fungus is really able to spread one of three ways. Sexual spores, or so-called summer spores, the asexual spores, and also little bits and pieces of the fungus can break off or be picked up by the fur of animals or the feet of birds and transported to another tree and start a new infection as long as a wound is available. The fungus is called Cryphonectria parasitica, but in fact, it has undergone a number of name changes it was originally called Diaporthe parasitica, then it became Endothea parasitica, and the most more recent name is Cryphonectria parasitica. This is actually a pretty common a phenomenon with fungi. They, they keep renaming them as new information becomes available. Uh, but uh, what you see over here is a petri dish in which I used to grow the fungus. Uh, many years ago. And basically you take a little piece of the fungus, put it in a nutrient agar medium, and then you expose it to alternating light and dark cycles, which is why it has these concentric rings that you see over here, uh, the lighter and darker color. But this orange color is very characteristic of the uh, fungus. It produces this orangish yellow pigmentation. Uh, hard to see, but in the center, it's already beginning to sporulate asexually. So even in an artificial medium, you can get asexual sporulation to occur um, in the fungus. So the American chestnut is not the only chestnut in the world. There is the Chinese chestnut, which is um, uh, Castinia melissima. There is the Japanese chestnut, uh, Castinia, um, I forget the name, that species name. And there is a European chestnut as well. Each of these can be distinguished from the other by the leaf characteristics and also the characteristic of the twigs and buds. But they are able to hybridize. So even though we call them separate species, they're able to hybridize, which in a way has saved the chestnut to some extent, uh, because what you buy today, when you buy a chestnut from a nursery, is basically either a Chinese chestnut or a hybrid Chinese American variety. You're not going to buy from a nursery pure American chestnut, no matter what they say, because pure American chestnut is still susceptible to blight. The American chestnut is called Castania uh, Drawing a blank again here. Um, it, it has large tooth like um, edges over here, and it has a elongated leaf like this that ends in a very sharp uh, edge or sharp base. So that's that's easy to tell the American chestnut from the Chinese chestnut, from the Japanese chestnut, and from the European chestnut, 
What is not easy to tell is when you have a hybrid. Hybrids, of course, will have some in-between characteristics of the two. And so um, there, it's a little bit, bit of fuzzier picture. Uh, but, but the pure American chestnut is easy to tell apart from the others based on the twig characteristics and also the uh, shape of the leaf and, and these large teeth-like uh, arrangements at the edges. The American chestnut has a very small uh, seed compared to the Chinese and the European chestnut. A European chestnut um, is, is what you typically buy uh, at, at Christmas time if you, if you buy chestnut for roasting or you buy the uh, Asian chestnut. The American chestnut is relatively small in size. In each of those birds that I showed earlier, you have either three or four of these small seeds. And they are pretty small and they have these typical necks that you see over here, which is easy to distinguish them based on the size characteristics plus the slow neck. The other ones don't have this. Um, and, and I wrote this here so I don't forget to tell you that the horse chestnut is not a chestnut. The horse chestnut, Aeschylus hippocastaneum, is a member of the buckeye family. The horse chestnut is not edible. It sort of looks like a chestnut. As far as the nuts are concerned, the leaf arrangement is totally different. doesn't look anything like a chestnut leaf but it is not an edible chestnut. And people often confuse uh, the fact that the uh, horse chestnut they think is also a kind of chestnut, but it is not. So when you go to the store uh, to buy a chestnut today, you don't buy these American chestnuts. You buy the Asian or the European variety, and that's what you wrote at Christmas time. Um, I don't know if you have roasted chestnuts, but if you do, you take them home, you cut a little X or cross in the um, seed coat so that the uh, steam can evaporate. And then you put it in the oven at 300 degrees, 350 for a few minutes. You can eat them raw as well, but typically people roast them and then don't forget to cut the little notch or cross into the uh, skin or the outer coat. Otherwise, they'll blow up as the steam expands. So most of the chestnuts in the natural range were dead by the 1950s. Uh, Robert Frost wrote a poem in the 1930s, rather prophetically, and he wrote this poem. Will the blight and the chestnut? The farmers rather guess not. It keeps smoldering at the roots and sending up new shoots till another parasite shall come to end the blight. So I mentioned earlier that the American chestnut is not extinct because even though the entire tree may die back, the root system stays alive. The fungus, this blight fungus, does not live in soil. In fact, we'll refer back to that in a moment later. Um, the root system stays alive and sends up uh, new uh, branches or new shoots, if you will. And those are the ones that grow a certain number of years, then they die back, then they grow again because the root system is still alive. So Frost couldn't have known this, but he actually was rather prophetic in this poem that he wrote. And here is why. In 1938, in Italy, 
a grove of Amer a grove of European chestnut was discovered to be dying of the blight because the fungus also got to Europe. But then a year later in the late 1938-39, they saw that all of a sudden the grove of chestnuts, the European chestnuts were not dying anymore. They were recovering. It was an interesting observation, but uh, then World War II intervened and everybody forgot about this phenomenon until the 1950s, when it was rediscovered that these European chestnuts were in fact recovering and were no longer dying from the fungus. So they started looking as to why this recovery was occurring. And eventually, after a number of years of trying to figure out what caused this recovery, they have come to a conclusion that there was a virus that was actually infecting the fungus. So when Frost said another parasite shall come to end the blight, he was right. The parasite being the virus that infects the blight fungus. And so here is a picture again of a virulent form of the fungus. That orange sporulation fills the petri dish very nicely. That's a nice, healthy looking fungus. Here is the one that's infected by a virus. You can see that it, it doesn't grow as well. It's morphologically different. It looks rather sickly. But more importantly, you can take a little piece of this, add it to this, or add it to the virulent fungus, and you get a converted one. In other words, the virulent fungus acquires the virus and itself becomes ill or sick and doesn't grow as well. This was a very exciting discovery and it was going to be perhaps the hope or the panacea for the American chestnut. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. Here in North America, this fungus is virulent. It can acquire the virus but the virus does not spread from tree to tree or from canker to canker. So you can take a canker and with painstaking effort by drilling holes and introducing the virus laden fungus, you can convert the canker to a non virulent or healing canker, much like they did in Europe except in Europe, it spreads naturally from tree to tree and grow to grow. For whatever reason, in North America, it does not. Well, of course, in Europe, they have the European chestnut, which is not the same as the American chestnut. The environmental conditions may be different, and so a number of different uh, phenomena may play um, into a recovery in Europe, but not here in North America. So that has been rather disappointing because we had hoped back in the 1970s and 80s, we were very excited to think that uh, this virus was going to defeat the fungus here in North America. There were some success stories for unknown reasons in Michigan, and the uh, western part of the lower part of Michigan, uh, the virus was able to spread. And when it did, then some of the chestnut could recover. So you see a beautiful American chestnut here in full bloom recovering here in Michigan. But unfortunately, that phenomenon did not translate to the rest of the uh, natural range of the American chestnut. 
Now, you can cure individual cankers by what is called the mud pack method. Basically, you take some mud from anywhere, garden soil, anything under the tree, anywhere, and you make a mud pack and you wrap it around in plastic and duct tape. You wrap it around the canker. You leave it there for about six months. Then you remove this contraption and the canker will be gone. The problem, of course, with that is that you have to treat individual cankers. A given tree may have five, six cankers. Some of them are going to be 20, 30 feet high. And it's almost impossible to do this on a large scale. Although you can obviously kill individual cankers uh, or the fungus in individual cankers by this method. So the so-called hypervalence or the infected fungus did not really work very well here in North America. But there are some other strategies to try to fight the blight. The American Chestnut Foundation is working on crossing Asian and American chestnut and back crossing them. This is a tried and true method with many um, various types of crops and hopefully we will find some resistant American chestnuts because the Asian chestnut obviously is resistant. They, uh, the Asian chestnuts have coexisted or co-evolved with the fungus and are not um, susceptible to the extent that the American chestnut is. The newest technique is a gen genetically modified chestnut seedling by introducing a gene from peat. This work is being done at um, SUNY ESF in Syracuse. They have developed what they think is a American chestnut with this modification with the wheat gene that is able to tolerate the fungus and will eventually perhaps allow us to uh, have um, a chestnut put back into the environment. The problem with, of course, with this is that it is a genetically modified American chestnut. And there are a lot of people who don't feel very comfortable about uh, releasing genetically modified um, crops of any type, including American chestnut into the environment. Finally, I'd like to close by mentioning the American Chestnut Foundation. Uh, the Chestnut Foundation started in the late 1970s and it has state chapters. The New York chapter is the oldest chapter of the foundation. But if you'd like more information, here's the address and also a website where you can find more information or perhaps even join the American Chestnut Foundation. I believe the annual group is about $40 a year, if I remember correctly. Um, this was just a brief introduction. There's so much to talk about. And if you have questions that I may not be able to answer right now, you can always uh, send me an email and I'll be more than happy to talk to you about various aspects of the American chestnut. But with that, I'm going to take your questions now, if you have some. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. That was very interesting. Um, I have a question. Sure. What is it in the mud pack that heals the canker? I, a variety of antagonistic organisms, uh, uh, probably several species of bacteria and some other fungi that are antagonistic and will kill the fungus, which is why the root system can stay alive because underground, the uh, fungus is not able to survive. It is killed off by the soil microorganisms. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Have they done any research on why those uh, trees out west have been able to survive and become uh, resistant to the blight? 
in yeah, Michigan. In Michigan to see if they can use that, whatever that is uh, on the other areas? We have never been able to satisfactorily answer that question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is something about the environment is maybe different. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure how to answer that. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, so we have a whole lot of questions here. Um, let's see, uh, Tracy, you asked something about the leaf of a chestnut oak. Were you just interested in what, what the comparison is in terms of the shape of the chestnut oak leaf versus? Uh, chestnut oak is often confused with an American chestnut. If you find a large tree that is in good shape and has leaves that look like the chestnut leaves. It's probably a chestnut oak, but the bark is different and the twigs are different. Um, my suggestion would be, since I don't have any pictures, is that you go on um, a website and you uh, Google it, look at the leaves and the bark and the twigs of the American chestnut and chestnut oak, but superficially, they look very similar. I I have uh, I have looked online at pictures. I have what I think is an American chestnut that now is about uh, an inch and a half in diameter at the base and about nine feet tall. Uh, and I've been observing it for the last three or four years, and it's it's grown probably six inches a year. And uh, I think it's an American chestnut. But I've had other people tell me, no, it's a chestnut oak. Uh, but I, I also have chestnut oak. And, and the leaves look a little different. Uh, the, uh, the tips of, of the jagged edge don't appear to be quite as sharp on the chestnut oak as on what this is that I think is an American chestnut. Um, I, it's, it's difficult. The, uh, the, the leaf leaves can differ from each other, even on the same tree. The, the better characteristic would be to look at some twigs, to example, uh -huh. and compare those. The buds uh, and, and the tips of the twigs would be a better indication. I, I, I don't think you can tell the difference in the bark until the tree gets bigger. Right, the bark is not gonna help you with a small tree, no. Right. Okay, um, Dave asked, is there any known vector for the fungus that enables it to move from tree to tree? It doesn't need a vector. Um, from tree to tree, uh, birds can carry it, squirrels can carry it, but unfortunately it's very efficient. Uh, and, and from tree to tree, if the trees are close enough, which they often are because when they send up uh, suckers or shoots from um, the root system, you, you usually have six or seven or eight stems and water can splash the uh, fungus from tree to tree if they're close enough. And otherwise the sexual spores are wind blown and can be carried from tree to tree or from great distances. Okay. Thanks. Um, Adrian asks, why is the oak that hosts the blight while it awaits, awaits new victims unaffected by this fungus? Have studies been done to see if there's something causing a resistance of the blight in oaks? And could that be used to inoculate the American chestnut? I'm not sure. Okay, let me put it this way. I don't know the answer to that. Perhaps there is an answer, but I don't know if there, I don't know that. Okay, um, Kathy asks, what native species of insects, birds uh, are or were supported by or dependent upon the American chestnut? So birds and insects. There, there were about 50 different species of insects. And um, if, if, you, if you look on some uh, website, you can find uh, the entire list of insects that were supported by the American chestnut. Uh, as far as birds, um, blue jays, passenger pigeon, turkeys, uh, and probably several other species uh, were, were dependent on the American chestnut. Okay. 
at one time. Okay. Um, Paul asks, if the hybrid of American and Asian is back crossed with an American, does the back cross retain resistance to the fungus? And, and that is the basis for the breeding technique. So you cross an American with an Asian, you take the progeny, you back cross it to against an American. Now you have a, a hybrid uh, with uh, many of the American characteristics. You take the offspring of that, you back cross it again as an American again, and you keep doing that. But the problem is that it's a hit and miss phenomenon. What you're trying to achieve is a certain degree of resistance or tolerance and have the American form. That is the tall, straight tree. The Asians are more like orchard tree looking thing. They're not uh, tall, straight, beautiful trees like the American. And unfortunately, those two characteristics, that is the form and the resistance often don't go hand in hand. So um, the uh, American Chestnut Foundation has a large farm in Virginia, Meadowview, Virginia. They are testing literally tens of thousands uh, progeny from these back crosses, trying to find resistant forms that have uh, good American form. Okay. All right. Um, and then Colette asks, did the blight cross over the Rockies? Uh, unfortunately, people have taken the blight, yes. Okay. They, they were both introduced on the West Coast back in the early days. Uh, Luther Burbank, for whom Burbank, California is named, was a very prominent uh, um, plant breeder who imported a lot of uh, different plants from all over the world to the West Coast. And so it has spread to the West Coast in both ways. People carrying it from the East across the Rockies and coming from Asia directly into California and also into Oregon and Washington. But, okay. but 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 uh, that that area, the West Coast area, is not the, the American chestnut is not native to that. You can grow chestnut there, and they do, but uh, unfortunately, those are also susceptible. Okay, um, Joshua asked. Uh, Typical Northeast forests now are variants of oak hickory or maple beech birch forest community types. Could you describe at all how our forests now differ from just chestnut dominated forests other than lacking chestnuts? Well, when the, when the chestnut was prevalent, many of these other species were not, including things like beech and some of the oaks were not nearly as prevalent as they are today. But, uh, our forests have undergone several changes, not just because of the death of the chestnut, but because of the incredible uh, deforestation and harvesting of our native forest in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So there are, there are a lot of differences in today's forests compared to what, what they were um, in the original virgin forests of North America. Okay. Um, Andrew asks, are the European types grown in the U.S. as orchard crops? Yes. Yes, they do. Yes. Yeah. No, a couple um, vineyards and wineries up the up Cayuga Lake on the west side are growing them. Yeah. Um, okay. And then Paul asks, has the Asian species or the Asian American hybrid become naturalized anywhere in U.S. forests? No, uh, it, it does not compete well. And, and as I mentioned, its form is a small shrub-like tree. 
or a small understory forest tree, maybe the size of a, uh, let, let's say a dogwood or a little bit bigger. And so they don't compete very well. I, I do have one more slide, which I kind of held back in anticipation of a question perhaps. But here is the uh, genetically modified chestnut seedling growing. Right now, they're waiting for permission to outplant them into the woods, into the forest. This is the so-called Darling 58, a genetically modified American chestnut uh, growing in laboratory and also in demonstration farms in Syracuse. And you can see that the tree is very small, but already it has catkins, as you can see over here. So even trees five, six, seven years old will start producing nuts. Um, the, uh, the gene that was inserted in here is a gene that uh, uh, detoxifies oxalic acid and it's from wheat. And it's a very common gene in many plants. Uh, the fungus apparently kills the American chestnut by producing this oxalic acid, which is toxic to the um, American chestnut. For some reason, but for reasons that are known, the Asian chestnut is tolerant or resistant, if you will, to this oxalic acid, the Asian chestnut will get cankers, but these are cankers that are superficial and they will heal over time. So the idea here is that if we can outplant the genetically modified tree, which some people are very much against, I must say, then they, are, they might get cankers but they will be able to tolerate them and survive. Great, thank you. Does any does anybody else have uh, questions? You can. Well, you have my email family. address. You have my email address. I'll be more than happy to entertain more questions, or you can send them to Christy, and then she can forward them to me. Are, are burls on oak uh, possibly the result of a canker on that oak? Um, not, not, not as far as I know, no. Uh, I, many, I, of, I, many of these burls that we see on, on hardwood trees, including uh, maples and other trees, um, are, so, are some sort of aberration, some sort of a hormonal aberration as far as I know, they're not the result of cankers. Uh, I would like to add my uh, experience with uh, trying to plant uh, uh, some of the hybridized uh, seeds on two occasions. Uh, only a few of them germinated and they didn't uh, really get to be more than a foot or so tall before they died. And I, I don't I don't think that it was because they got the the fungus. I think it's some something other than that uh, that they just weren't uh, that hardy or something. Yeah, it, it's possible. Uh, you can get uh, really good results by buying seed or seedlings from rep reputable nurseries. The most successful hybrid. Uh, it's called a Dunstan chestnut. And sometimes it is called an American chestnut, but it isn't. It's a hybrid. But, um, but that's something that you can buy from nurseries. Uh, seeds are hit and miss. Um, the, these, these I didn't purchase. Uh, they were sent to me from the American Chestnut Foundation. Yeah. And I... I believe they were supposed to have been 15 sixteenths American chestnut, one sixteenth Chinese. Yeah. 
um, it, it could have been a sight difference. The, the most important characteristics for soil is um, well-drained and a pH around five. So, so um, before, before you plant any chestnut, either seed or seedling, um, a soil test needs to be done to make sure that it has the appropriate conditions for a growing chestnut. I have planted hundreds and hundreds of seeds and have had fairly good success, but a certain number of them are just not going to germinate. And it's just a hit and miss. Um, These were in containers. Okay. Yeah, I, I, it might have been a side characteristic. Okay. Well, thank you again, Steve. Thanks so much.